Hello everyone, and welcome to the 152nd episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Pazuzu from the Exorcist franchise. Inspired by the real-world exorcisms of a boy named Roland Doe, the Exorcist series is one that presents us with a seemingly immovable and massively sadistic evil, the ancient demon god, Pazuzu. We're going to run through what little information we're given about this demonic entity and its motivations, and by doing so, perhaps we can discern whether or not there's more to this character than meets the eye. Also, if you weren't aware, there's a new Exorcist movie that came out not too long before I made this video, and you should absolutely go watch it, because it's quite the treat to watch a film that in my view is actually worse than the second Exorcist film, which many people consider to be one of the worst films ever made, so make sure you don't miss out on this one. Now without further ado, let's begin. In the ancient Mesopotamian religions of civilizations like Akkad, Assyria, Babylon, and Sumeria, there were gods aplenty who the peoples of these nations paid homage to. Though knowledge of these ancient figures have been left behind in the public consciousness by the march of time, there are still several names from this pantheon that many of you may recognize. Nurgle, Enlil, Enki. These are some of the gods whose names have managed to resurface outside circles of archaeological and historical study throughout the long centuries since worship of them ceased. But they are the few of the many who have managed to enjoy some time in the public spotlight. While many of these ancient gods, even the ones who were considered benevolent, have murky moral standings. Like any religion, there are entities who are far more nefarious in nature. One such entity is our subject of this video, Pazuzu, the demonic god who was heralded as the king of the wind demons. Save for perhaps Dagon and Nurgle, Pazuzu is more well known than any other god or demon from this time period in the modern era, which of course is due to the success of the Exorcist franchise. In ancient myths, Pazuzu's appearance is said to be a mishmash of various animals. He has a scaled canine body, bird talons for feet, two pairs of wings, a scorpion's tail, and a serpent's member. His face is similarly mixed. He has human ears, a dog-like muzzle, bulging eyes, wrinkled cheeks, and atop his head are two gazelle's horns. While Pazuzu was always regarded as an evil figure within the Mesopotamian religions, his designation as an entity of pure unabashed evil in the Exorcist universe wasn't always the case. In Mesopotamian myths, Pazuzu is the son of the god Hanpu, the god of evil, and as the son of the representative of evil himself, Pazuzu's position within this pantheon bears many similarities to his father. Pazuzu was considered a force of destruction, the master of the winds and all the demons of that wind, a being who could carry plagues through the air and devour entire populations with his vicious winds. However, Pazuzu was also considered a protector god, and the iconography associated with him was used for this purpose. People would place Pazuzu statuettes at the entrance to their homes so they might keep lesser wind demons from entering, and pregnant women wore Pazuzu pendants to protect them from the demon Lamashtu, who was said to target unborn babies for evil purposes, including to induce miscarriages in their mothers. While the evil nature of Pazuzu was always known to people who invoked his favor, it wasn't until these pagan religions began to decline in favor of Christianity and Islam that Pazuzu's virtuous side was forgotten in favor of labeling him solely as a villainous demon. By the time that the story of the exorcist begins, it seems that Pazuzu has decided that should be the case as well, as any semblance of benevolence the entity might have once had has completely disappeared. Perhaps that has something to do with how forgotten he's become, or it could be that because he was labeled as a demon in the Judeo-Christian sense and banished to the depths of hell by God and his son, perhaps whatever virtue lay within Pazuzu was eliminated upon his condemnation to hell, a being racked with rage who no longer cared for any moral plight, one who now only sought to corrupt the precious creations of a higher power that would see him burn in the fires of ruination. Not only that, but upon being cast down to hell, Pazuzu presumably relinquished much of his free will as every demonic entity is ultimately beholden to the will of Satan. With that in mind, what we see Pazuzu doing throughout the Exorcist mythos is very much in line with what we've come to expect from Satan's demons. In the second film, it's said that Pazuzu has continuously plagued humanity since his fall. However, in the two prequel films, Exorcist the Beginning and Dominion, prequel to the Exorcist, we learn that Father Marin, who remarked that he had a battle with Pazuzu years prior to his discovery of Pazuzu-related artifacts in Iraq, first fought with the demon when he joined an archaeological dig that resurfaced an ancient Byzantine church in the Trakana region of Kenya. We learn that this church, which is in pristine condition, was built upon a temple dedicated to Pazuzu, where human sacrifice was performed. And once it was built, it was immediately buried to keep his evil from spreading, and its rediscovery leads to the long dormant Pazuzu being unleashed upon the world once again, which is what brings us to the events of the first film. Here we find Pazuzu possessing Reagan McNeil simply to provide her torment, often through horrific and gruesome means that are meant to shock and awe the people around her. We're never given any indicator that Pazuzu is attempting to take her body for himself so he can walk amongst mortals, nor are we made to believe that by possessing her, Pazuzu will somehow be able to manifest itself by absorbing their life force, which would be pretty common motivations for demons.
demons. But no, the goal, at least in this story, is mayhem for the sake of mayhem. In the second film, Pazuzu is given a bit more motivation in that he supposedly always targeted people who have the capacity to become great healers, a corruption of the purity of those who provide one of the world's most benevolent and important functions so he might further the suffering he causes not just to the one he possesses, but all the people that person may have been able to save with their abilities had they been left untouched. In the third film and second book, his motivations are much more personal, as here he's transported the soul of the Gemini killer, along with his own, into the body of Father Karis, and it's through this vessel that Pazuzu and his new sidekick once again unleashes misery upon the world by gruesomely murdering several people by possessing others. Also, Pazuzu can enact his revenge on Father Karis by tormenting his body and soul even after he's passed on. The TV series gives us a greater motivation for Pazuzu, that being his complicity in a plot being orchestrated by a cabal of cultists, who are disguised as good Catholics to murder the Pope and bring about a new age of darkness and despair. Though even here, for the majority of the first season, Pazuzu is attempting to repossess Reagan and integrate with her completely by getting to her through her daughter Casey, a departure from his previous motive of simply causing misery for misery's sake. It's here that we also get to see the form that Pazuzu approaches his victims in as well. In the first film, Pazuzu infests Reagan by impersonating her imaginary best friend, Captain Howdy. But we never get to see this Captain Howdy side of Pazuzu, as the only glimpses we get of him are two shots of his vampire-esque appearance. In the show, Pazuzu takes on the persona of the salesman, and that's how he initially approached Casey and earned her trust. Before the situation escalates, and Pazuzu sheds his benevolent guise for a more malicious one, we see that Pazuzu is quite proficient in tantalizing his victims with false promises, gazing into their souls to find what they want most in order to honeypot them with the actualization of their desires through his power. This sentiment is somewhat present in the films, but here is where we definitely get to see the more tactical side of Pazuzu. It's here that we're also given a bit of interesting information about Pazuzu's place in the demonic hierarchy, as there is a point where the Pazuzu-possessed Reagan demonstrates the authority he has over this group of conspirators, forcing them all to bow down to him with his demonic powers when he introduces himself to the group. Ultimately, though, Pazuzu is eventually defeated in one way or another, and though it's never truly eliminated, it is always dealt with for a time. So, now that we've glossed over all the various pieces of media that Pazuzu has appeared in, which includes four and a half films, two books, and an entire season of a TV series, why in the hell is this video so short? Well, honestly, that's because I think, and hope, that aside from what we've already discussed, that Pazuzu's intentions and motivations will remain largely malicious for the sake of being malicious. In these videos, we're trying to delve into the depths of evil, deciphering why these characters and people do what they do, but sometimes, there isn't really all too much to read into why a person or entity chooses to commit evil deeds, especially one who seems to have been fated to be evil since they were born. In that way, perhaps Pazuzu is a tragic figure, a being born of an evil father who is destined to be evil no matter whether it wanted to be evil or not. Regardless of whether that's the case or not, I think it's perfectly fine and even a good thing for Pazuzu's motivations to be pretty shallow in nature. Because you know what? Sometimes a demon just wants to mess with you. It wants to see your mother cry and your body disintegrate. It wants to play with your emotions and distort your mind into a beacon of agony that tears your soul asunder. And sometimes, that's really all there is to it. But even though that's about as simple as evil can get, sometimes a massively intricate plan, an engaging backstory, and cryptic and meaningful dialogue aren't really needed to instill terror within us. As I, for one, find myself pretty horrified at the thought of an entity entering into my body and attempting to utterly destroy me and everyone I love just because it can, a monster whose every action is evil for the sake of being evil. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on Pazuzu? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, my patrons, and to anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and subreddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.